Endurance is the story of Sir Ernest Shackleton's daring expedition across the Antarctic. In August of 1914, Shackleton and 27 crew men boarded the Endurance on their way to the frozen continent. Expedition photographer Frank Hurley captured much of the journey on film, both in movie and still photography, which along with personal diaries was used to compile the moving documentary. During the December of 1914, Endurance entered the ice fields of the Weddell Sea. Navigating through the pack ice was perilous. With approximately 100 miles left in their journey, Shackleton made the fateful decision to stop and wait for a break in the ice. However, an extreme drop of temperature caused the ice to enclose the ship, leaving them unable to proceed. Trapped in the drifting ice pack, the crew lived aboard ship for 10 months. Finally, with the ships coming to the ice, Shackleton gave the order to abandon ship. Carrying minimal supplies and dragging three lifeboats, the crew began to march in a search for safety. Before leaving the ship behind, Hurley salvaged all of the photographic negatives. However, in order to travel light, he would not be allowed to keep them all. The narrator gave the following account. Together, he, Frank Hurley, and Shackleton selected 120 negatives and seated, sealed them in tin canisters. The remaining 400 Shackleton had Hurley destroyed, so that he would not be able to recover them later. And so they continued their perilous journey but it was difficult for them as they moved ahead. The result was all were saved, but there were things which were lost, things that they could not recover from what had been previously a significant part of their work. So what's, you know, what is the, what's the significance of the story? The reality was that it was huge effort, which required on part of Shackleton and Hurley, both to do two things. One is to preserve the lives of the crew members which were there, all 27 survived. But also it required a huge effort to preserve the, the, the photography which was there, to preserve the, rec the, the visual record which was there. What's the point of it? Things which are important take effort. Things which are important require hard work. They require determination. They require the discipline of individuals to see things through to the end. The same could be true of marriage. Marriage is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It begins with the promises of fidelity and exclusivity and two individuals madly in love, excited on the day which is there. They, the fulfillment, the joy which is there. It's surrounded by family and friends. It's, it's marvelous, marvelous day. But then life sets in. Disappointments happen. Distractions occur. Life starts getting more difficult. Work, children, conflicts, external, internal pressures, temptations to find pleasures elsewhere, the realization that the person I married is not perfect. Matter of fact, the more I get to mo know them, the more I get to see their imperfections. And the sad thing is that many times the imperfections totally eclipse the things which attracted us to them in the first place. And the marriage is strained. It's difficult. It's no longer pleasurable. And then it's vulnerable at the same time. The reality for us is well that for the last half century, marriage has not fared well, not fared well at all in our country. Even though divorce rates are down, they're still incredibly high. Last year for which statistics are available from the Center for Disease Control is in 2018. During that period of time, there were like 2.1 million marriages which took place. At the same period of time, there were approximately 850,000 divorces which took place. Put it simply, for every 10 marriages which started out in 2000, in 2018, there were four of them that also ended in divorce. So Jesus turns from being kind and loving one's neighbor, God kind of talks about the inverse, don't murder somebody, to the importance of marriage and the family, which is there. And he talks about, in a sense, the prohibitions, it's stated as such, 
But by it, we also understand implicitly what it means for us, what it takes, what kind of effort and sacrifice is gonna be there for us to safeguard the integrity, the fidelity, the security, the longevity of our marriage. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. If your right hand eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose part of your body than your whole body to go to hell. Strong words. Jesus' words are always strong. They're soul searching. They're provocative. It forces to be sober, stop, and listen, which is there. There is a reason for that. And that is just as human life is important, marriage is important. It's a gift from God, it's God's gift to humanity for a number of reasons. He authored it for our companionship, for our well-being. Genesis 3.18 says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground and all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, birds of the air, the beasts of the field. But, for Adam, there was no suitable helper was found. No one. He was alone. And God remedied the problem. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed it up, the, the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to him, to the man. The man said, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then in an editorial comment, it says this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they'll become one flesh. And they experience unity. Marriage, it's a gift from God. Marriage. It is also used to describe the relationship in the Old Testament between God and Israel. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, it says this, For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name, the Holy One of Israel, your Redeemer. He is called God of all the earth. In Jeremiah, as he calls people back to the faithful covenant of the Lord, he says this, chapter 3, verse 14, Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. I will choose you out of from one town to two from a clan to bring you to Zion. Consequently, as well, in the Old Testament, when that relationship between Yahweh and his people were broken, it was said of his, the people that they committed adultery against the Lord. In the New Testament, the picture continues. It's a picture now of Christ and his church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, puts it this way. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, for I am talking about Christ and church. Third reason is this, marriage. It's the foundation of the family. It is what, in a sense, allows societies to live together and to stay together. And the reality is for us as well, children don't fare well in the long run if their parents either aren't married or they have been married and they separate or divorce. There is acrimony which is there. For a child, separation, the breakdown of a marriage is the destruction of their own civilization. It's painful, I know, to hear that but it's painful for a child to experience it. And so we need to understand, in a sense, the issues which are before us if we're going to understand how we safeguard these things. And so we have marriage as being the foundation of the family for the benefit of all humanity, which is there. 
But Jesus has said this, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. That was, that was the seventh commandment. Clearly stated by God regarding the sanctity of marriage. Don't violate the covenant relationship which is there between you and your spouse. And so as a result of that, he talks about the fact that we need to be careful not only to engage in physical adultery, but he says this, it goes beyond this. Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, what does that mean? It doesn't mean simply a glance and recognition of someone who is attractive, but it becomes that lingering thought, gaze, even implies here a stare. We stare at something. We're captivated by it. We're intrigued by it. When we stare at something, we begin to enjoy it, fantasize about it, want it, want to possess it. He says, no, don't do this. Because if you lust, you look at a woman lustfully, and the converse is true for a woman, to look at a man lustfully, lustfully, has committed adultery already in his heart. It's violated the covenant which is there. The sad thing is that not only does it violate the covenant which is destructive to the marriage, but it also deprecates and destroys the object of that particular lust, that lust which is there. The seventh commandment, do not commit adultery, follows the sixth, do not murder. There's a relationship between the two. And the relationship is this. It is the devaluing of another person. Lust and all that goes with it, when it is unchecked, is exploitative, it reduces the person to the object of love, to something to be briefly enjoyed before being discarded, it is something which, in a sense, after a while, despises that which is there. You see that, the story of Absalom and his sister, when he lusted after her, he wanted her, he raped her, and then he wanted nothing to do with her. It's destructive behavior all the way through. Everyone suffers. No one gets away with it. It is something which is to be avoided at all costs, and, and it is to be fought against all the time. So consequently, Jesus says this, you've got to take drastic action on this. And he puts it in very strong terms, strongest terms possible for taking action. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand offends you, if it causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. What's Jesus talking about? Is he, is he advocating self-mutilation? Is he saying, I really want you to do this. If you've ever lusted, gouge your eye out. If you've, if you've violated something with your hand, cut it off. Strong language, but we need to understand that language is language, and not all language needs, is intended to be taken to literal sense. Jesus is not interested in his disciples mutilating themselves. That would not be terribly attractive as far as inviting someone else to come to Christ. But what he is interested in, and what is he saying very, very quick, clearly, that he is commanding us to do whatever it takes to safeguard our hearts and our marriages. He tells us that to avoid destroying our lives, ourselves, and our marriages, it will require drastic action. So what Jesus is telling us is that these words mean and require the sacrifice that we need to make to keep ourselves and our conscience and our relationships intact. And that these actions are going to be hard and they're going to be painful. And yet Jesus honors us by thinking that we can even make the attempt. We're going to fail. We have failed. All of us have sinned. And all of us have sinned in this particular area. And we're probably going to sin again. But Jesus says this, even if you do, even if you did, even if you will, you have to take drastic action. You have to do whatever it takes to discipline yourself because of the destruction which is there to yourself 
and it's destructive to your marriage, it's destructive to the person of whom becomes the object of this particular lustful affection. Take the action, take it quickly, take it carefully. And he honors us by saying, you can do this. You can do this. And so he saved, calls us to safeguard our marriage by being single-minded. But he also calls us to safeguard our marriage through fidelity and forgiveness. Verse 31, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now, what Jesus was referring to here was not one of the Ten Commandments, but what Jesus was referring to here was the divorce as a, as a divine concession given in the, in the Deuteronomic law. You pick it up in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. And after she leaves his house, becomes a wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives her it to her and sends her out from his house, or if he dies, then the first husband who divorces her is not allowed to marry her again after she has become defiled. That would be decessible in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now, we we'll talk about Jesus' perspective on all this in a moment when he addresses the issue again in Matthew chapter 19. But what you have in Deuteronomy gives structure to the dissolution of marriage in several ways. It wasn't simply that you could arbitrarily end the marriage. There was a, there was a legal requirement which had been there. A document had to be filed. It was a certificate of divorce. There had to be a reason for it. The reason is vague in the Old Testament. Something indecent about her. But it wasn't about a whim. It wasn't about something which uh, was simply a loss of affection or love. There had to be a reason which would allow this to take place. It was given really to protect the woman because she was the most vulnerable one in the relationship, the most easily exploited, which was there. And the result was the prohibition of remarriage to the first spouse, if an intervening take place, made someone to say, I got to think about this carefully. Because once I do this, I can't undo what has been done. There was also within it an implicit right that was there to bury someone else. And this sets the stage for the conversation which was going on at the time of Jesus. At the time of Jesus, there was a debate which was going on between two very influential um, Jewish rabbis. The one was Rabbi Hillel. The Rabbi Hillel thought of some uncleanness could mean anything that a husband wanted to, to be. Personal hygiene, bad housekeeping, bad attitude, Whatever it was, if you, as a husband, were given a sense of incredible power to make these decisions, you could make these decisions, you could simply proceed and secure a divorce by writing out a certificate which was there. Rabbi Shammai, on the other hand, said no, no, and cleanness has nothing to do with one's personal hygiene or personal algae traits or anything like that. It had to do whether or not the wife was sexually unfaithful. If that would be the case, that would be a grounds for divorce. But Jesus takes what is said and he adds to it. He says to his disciples that if you divorce one's wife for any other reason other than adultery, you place her in the position, assuming that she's going to get remarried, that she will be committing an act of adultery in the, consequent, in the, in the consummation of that subsequent marriage. What Jesus is doing is he's narrowing the possibility of divorce in order to protect 
the parties from divorcing prematurely or unnecessarily or self-destructively, and also protecting the woman and also protecting the inevitable pain of separation of loss. The discussion of divorce and remarriage comes up again in Matthew chapter 19. Here, some Pharisees come to Jesus, and they are what they were always doing, and that was trying to find a way to trap Jesus, trying to get him tripped up. And ask the question, is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They wanted him to pick sides, which is there. Jesus really skips over the whole debate between Hillel and Shammai and goes back to the book of Genesis. Haven't you read, he replied, that from the beginning, the creator made them male and female, he said, and for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. He is going back to Genesis and saying this, the intent of God is that this relationship, as rocky and as difficult and as challenging as it might be in life, is intended to be for life. And so as a consequence of that, it's not to be torn apart by anybody who is there. But then the conversation comes back. They didn't get the answer they wanted, so they challenged him again. Why then, they asked, did Moses give a command that to give his wife a certificate of divorce and then send her away? And Jesus, once again, cuts to the heart of the issue. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Oh, not a necessity, but it is a consequence of what is there. And once again, Jesus brings them back to Genesis from the beginning. This was not, but it was not this way from the beginning. And he reiterates what he says earlier. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. This sent shockwaves into the hearers which were there. The disciples said to him, if this situation, if this is a situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. And then Jesus goes on to have a discussion about the value of celibacy. The point is, Jesus doesn't want his people to be divorcing. He wants them to be reconciling. He wants them to be forgiving. He wants them to be safeguarding their relationship by simply saying, we're going to work this out. At best, one can say that adultery becomes a permission to proceed with a divorce. It's never a requirement. It's never something which says, oh, good, I got the reason. No, that's not at all. Because Jesus tells us that we are to be individuals who are forgiving people, reconciling, healing individuals, restoring that which has been broken, welcoming individuals who have sinned back into our lives. Why? Because it's painful for everybody. It's painful for children, painful for the people apart who, who are a part of it. It's never easy. And it's never, it never is clean. Put it this way, it's like taking two sheets of paper and taking your bottle of glue. It doesn't matter what kind of glue it is, but you spread the glue out in one sheet of the paper and then you put it all together. The two pieces of paper have now become one. The one. But what happens if you choose to separate them? You pull them apart. You know, they never pull apart well. One sticks to another. There's bits and pieces stuck to the other person. It's a ragged edge. It's very painful. What Jesus is saying here is not in the sense to look for a reason why I, can't, I can get out of a tough situation. What Jesus is saying is this. Marriage has been intended by God to be a lifelong relationship with another person. There are sad and painful consequences when that ends. Now, having said all that, I know that in our particular culture, a no-fault divorce, our legal system says 
if you are married and you want to get a divorce, you have to have no reason to do that other than you are simply saying, I want out of this, I will be done. You can begin the legal process. There's nothing that can be done to delay that. There's nothing that can be done to stop it. And many individuals have found themselves desperately wanting, desperately doing whatever they can to bring healing into that relationship. Well, totally beyond their control. To that, Jesus says something else. He says, I love you. I understand. I know your difficulty. I know your heart. I know your intent. I hear your pain. I want you to know that you are, even as a divorced person, loved, valued, cherished. You're precious, precious to me. Jesus always speaks words of love and kindness and forgiveness and tenderness to those who've experienced failed marriages. We know that's true because we know that's how Jesus responded. You have the story in John chapter 4. Jesus goes to Samaria. He counts a woman at the well in Samaria. He has this lengthy theological conversation and then gets rather personal that she says, I. Jesus said, well, go, go tell your husband. She said, I have no husband. And, and, and Jesus says, I, I know that's true. I know that's true. You've been divorced five times, and the man you're living with is not your husband. I, I know that it's true. And Jesus understood that he was talking to a woman who had been deeply, deeply wounded in life. And was in desperate need of being loved and valued and experiencing the magnanimity of his grace and forgiveness. And so he treats her, this woman, we don't know her name, Jesus did, with love and respect. And she becomes, interestingly enough, the first evangelist of the Gospels. She's the one who goes to her village. She's the one who tells them the Messiah, the one we've been talking about, is, is here. She leads her whole community out to be with Jesus. Then you have the story in John chapter 8. A woman caught in adultery. I always found it rather interesting. How can you catch a woman in adultery and not catch a man in adultery? But we're not given the details of that particular story. And the Pharisees and their self-righteous behavior want to take her out and stone her, and, and Jesus intervenes. And we don't know what he wrote in the sand, but basically we know what he said, and that is, you're without sin, you can cast the first stone. And so in doing so, what Jesus was offering to this woman, again, an unknown, an unnamed woman, woman known only to Jesus, was words of tenderness, love, and compassion. What Jesus is telling us is since what Friedrich Bruner in his commentary in the book of Matthew says this, that Jesus commands, draws a definite circle around a married couple and writes beside them, do not touch. They're married, don't touch them. If you're married, don't touch somebody else. Stay in the circle. It's difficult. It's going to have its challenges. It's going to have its difficulties. You will have perhaps a long time to work out the issues which are there, but it's well worth it in the end. It's well worth it in the end to hear the words of Jesus. Amen.